Why is purpose important for companies? Well, all you need to do is spend 30 minutes on Google, Googling purpose-driven companies and the value that they create. And you'll find lots and lots of articles, an increasing number of articles, that actually talk about the fact that purpose-driven companies outperform their competitors in terms of um, uh, the financial performance of the business, creating much, much more shareholder value than non-purpose-driven companies. There's also increasing research and data uh, that proves out that purpose-driven companies naturally attract um, top talent, but they also manage to retain uh, top talent as well. Um, but the most important thing for a purpose-driven company is to be so, so clear, not only on what the purpose is, but the articulation of that purpose so that everybody in the organization, everybody outside of the organization that works in the organization can articulate the purpose just in a sentence or a phrase that people find inspirational. And throughout the course of this um, uh, session, I'm going to take you through what Coca-Cola's stated purpose is and how that impacted the performance of the company and the performance of marketing. And then more recently, Airbnb's stated purpose, and you'll see how our stated purpose has impacted our marketing output. One of the important things is purpose-driven companies don't only use their purpose in times of good, they also use their purpose when the company itself is faced with real challenges and real headwinds. And um, just this time last year, Airbnb was um, uh, facing a really, really serious um, uh, crisis on our platform, which was threatening to compromise our purpose. And I'll share with you the story and the actions and the resulting output of how we lent into protecting our purpose um, and doing right by the platform, right by the community. Now, I think it's really, really, really important that um, everybody spends time thinking about their own personal purpose and their impact, not only on the work that they do, but their impact on the overall company performance and hopefully the impact on your own personal legacy. Um, and for me, I am very, very clear. I have two values that guide everything I do. One was taught to me by my mom and the other I educated myself on. So I came from a council estate in the north of England. My mom had five different boys to three different men by the age of 27. She was very beautiful, but she was a little foolish. Um, uh, but, and she, didn't, she brought us up as a single parent and she didn't really have anything time or dollars to give us because she was alone with five boys. The thing that she gave all of us was this understanding on how to be a decent human being, how to treat each other with respect and kindness and empathy and compassion. Those were the kind of values that I remember in my childhood having conversations with my four brothers and uh, my mom about why it was really, really important. And that's impacted her legacy in quite a significant way. Three of my four brothers have been with their wives for over 30 years. Now here she is coming from a series of um, dynamic uh, relationships that left her with five kids. Um, and yet she taught three of her sons how to respect women and partner and be loyal, and three of them have had relationships for over 30 years. Now, on a Leeds council estate, that's pretty rare. So my mum's teachings of humanity is something that has shaped all five boys' lives in a very, very significant way. And you'll see how her teachings on humanity have shaped my creative work. In fact, if you were being critical of my creative work, you'd say, well, it all looks the same. It's just a bunch of people hugging each other. And I make no apology for that because I think that that kind of work makes the world a little better. The second value that I have, and forgive this rather weird picture, um, uh, but it's from an, um, uh, an artist in the late 90s who basically took a load of people who were around um, uh, 40 years old and uh, got them to share a picture of when they were six years old. Uh, and then he kind of graphed the two of them together 
way before kind of Photoshop was making this look like it's easy to do. Um, and the reason why I always put this um, image in my um, presentations is because I think as a creative leader of any organization, and when I say a creative leader, you all are creative leaders. Creativity is not the responsibility of a few people in an organization. Creativity, creativity is the responsibility for everybody in the organization, regardless of discipline. Um, uh, but sometimes it's really important that I show up to my team and to my partners as the now 50-year-old exec that has a lot of experience on leading a team and managing business, etc. But also, if I'm dealing with creativity, then it's really important that I bring that eight-year-old child to the meeting. And so sometimes when we're in, um, having creative conversations, I want the 50-year-old to leave the room because I want to geek out like an eight-year-old playing Lego for the first time. So it helps to make sure that I'm exploring all of the different creative opportunities. And I think it's really, really important sometimes that you do think, is this appropriate now that I'm the eight-year-old? child that I once was, that was excited about new things, that was curious, that was experimental, that was open, or is now the time for me to step back into my 30, 40, 50 year old self and be the reasoned and seasoned business executive. And all I would say to you, lesson um, uh, number one, is that both matter and both are important. And unfortunately, sometimes with the pressures of business, business leaders forget that in order to get the best out of the team, presenting yourself as an eight-year-old child is sometimes the most valuable thing you can do. So everything that I do in my life, and I think about it literally every day, have I been the best human being I can be? And some, it's really hard being a decent human being. Sometimes I fail miserably. In fact, if you met my partner, the German, you would know that sometimes I fail at being a decent human being. Uh, and he goes, the thing is, you're nice to everybody else, but when you get home, you're really, really miserable. Where's the great humanity? And it's like, well, it's exhausting, Mirko, being a decent human being, but I do try <laughs> to be a decent human being. Um, but then I also say, have I been the most creative person that I can be today or this week? Uh, so have I been the best human being I can possibly be, and have I been the most creative? And if I go for two or three days where the answers to both those questions are no, I know that I'm doing something wrong or I'm in a situation that is compromising my sense of purpose and I need to change it. So everything that you'll ever find written about me, all of the um, signature um, uh, tones in my work, you can trace back to trying to make the world a better place in terms of humanity and trying to make the world a better place in terms of creativity. So let's now just take a little look at how my values and my purpose drove some of the work that I did at Coca-Cola. So you can only imagine, I had a great career in London uh, and I'm 38 years old and I get a call from a headhunter in Chicago and the headhunter says, hi Jonathan, the Coca-Cola company are looking for vice president of global advertising, strategy and creative. And literally my response was, hmm, who do I know that could do that, because that sounded like a big job. And the headhunter said, well, actually, we're quite interested in you. Would you, would you like to go for this interview? And immediately, my voice deepened. Oh, yes, uh, of course. I mean, I could quite easily see myself doing that job. But I flew to Atlanta just thinking they would see straight through me. There's no way that they would give me that job. Uh, and I ended up getting the job. And um, to be honest, I was shit scared. The very first day that I, I um, started working at the Coca-Cola company, because it is the ultimate icon of corporate America. It's the ultimate brand icon, and its marketing practices are so, so sophisticated all over the world. And what did I know? I was an ad guy that felt as if I was an imposter in the ad industry. I'm sure as hell going to feel like an imposter leading the creative fortunes of the world's biggest brand. Um, but what I realized very early on that I had to do is understand the purpose of the brand and understand the archive of the brand because if I could become expert on Coke's purpose and expert on Coke's history, I might stand a chance at at least lasting a year before I got fired and went back to the UK, tail between the legs. 
And so the Coca-Cola's brand purpose is, and it has always been, is the antidote to modern day woes. So when you're feeling down, uh, when you need a little pick-me-up, when the world is a little bit troubled, then Coca-Cola is that simple pleasure that can just lift you. Now, we all know, because we see this all the time, that one of the modern woes that Coca-Cola is reminding people of is the physical um, need that the drink can address, which is thirst. But also, when I started to look in Coca-Cola's archive, I started to see that Coke had lent into other modern woes that were culturally really significant, such as isolation, depression, suspicion, sexism. Coke was the first advertiser to actually put a female exec in an office place. Uh, so Coke had really, really lent into some of these cultural tensions. But the one that I'm going to share with you now is the tension around racism and something that still today all over the world um, the human race is plagued with. So I'm in Coca-Cola's archive and I spend literally the first three months every Wednesday, I spend every Wednesday afternoon in Coca-Cola's archive. Now just to put that into some context, Coca-Cola's archive is the world's most valuable private archive. It has original Andy Warhols, original Norman Rockwells, and it basically has you know, um, original prints and videos and everything and merchandise of all of the iconic moments in that brand's 130 year old history. Now, um, I was looking through a load of different ads and I came across this one ad which, for whatever reason, it just spoke to me, it just stopped me in my tracks and I'll share with that with you in a moment. Um, and I said to the archivist, um, a, a, a guy called Phil, who'd actually been Coca-Cola's archivist when I first met him, he'd been the archivist for 41 years, so that guy knew more about the company than anybody else. And I said, this ad speaks to me, help me understand what it is. He said, it's interesting that that ad speaks to you, Jonathan, because it was the world's first ever ad that had black people and white people in it together. And he said, and it's a really, really interesting story because um, the, it was shot in 1969, but it didn't actually run until 1971 because the Coca-Cola company were nervous about actually putting it out there into the world. I asked what prompted the ad's production, and um, Phil took me through the very tragic story of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1968. And he uh, was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. And without even thinking about the protocol, the Coca-Cola company chief exec sent the Coca-Cola company corporate jet to Memphis to retrieve Dr. Martin Luther King's body. The Coca-Cola company also said to the city of Atlanta, no budget considerations at all around the policing of his funeral. We're going to give um, Dr. Martin Luther King a statements-like funeral, and the military and the police force and the cost of all that, we will um, uh, cover that. And so Atlanta, of course, was in deep, deep grief, and there was lots and lots of anger. But because the citizens of Atlanta saw the city's response to facilitating a statement like uh, a, a statements like funeral, then there were no riots in Atlanta during the weekend of Dr. Martin Luther King's funeral, unlike all of the other cities across the U.S. A terrible, terrible dark time. And a couple of months um, after that very, very tragic event, the chief exec of Coke said you know what, we as a brand, we as the most valuable brand, we as the most creative and culturally significant, have a role to play to say that racism is not welcome in this country. And so they produced this ad. And it's called Boys on the Bench, 1969. The first time ever in human history, black and white people were seen in an ad together. Now, when you look at this ad, let's just take a more detailed look at this ad to really appreciate its significance. Um, now, I'm a Coca I was a Coca-Cola marketer, and uh, I love this ad because I've got a great drink shop. I mean, look at that. You always got to have somebody drinking Coke, looking, looking like it's refreshing. But if you take a more detailed look at this ad, the actual setting of this ad was on a segregation bench. And all across the southern states of the U.S., 
On one side of this bench, you'd have black so coloreds only. On the other side, you'd have whites only. And Coke chose that symbolic setting to put black and white people together in advertising for the first time. But let's take a closer look at this, and you see that the black boy and the white boy's knees are touching. So think about that. First time you've got black and white people together in an ad, you set it on something that um, is a symbol of segregation, and then around the segregation bar, you put the black guy and the white guy's knees touching. This was such a, and it, I had no idea of all of this context or all this story. I just pulled it out and go, oh my goodness, that's beautiful. It just spoke to me in a really, really significant way. And so I decided then that my responsibility whilst I was at Coca-Cola was to do work that would shape the brand and shape culture. I was hoping in a way that was, you know, a 10% of the significance of this amazing and incredible piece of work. And this became the t-shirts that I would wear all around the world. This became the back of my business card. It was my email signature. Everybody was like, yeah, Jonathan loves boys on the bench. And not general boys on the bench. <laughs> this particular expression of boys on the bench. And so how did that shape the work that um, uh, I did? Well, it was interesting because, you know, I look around the world and I'm looking for tensions of racism to see if there was anything that um, the brand could insert itself into in a credible and organic way. And I quickly, because India was such a huge market for us, I quickly became aware of the tensions between India and Pakistan and the fact that the governments are letting both nations down and the fact that you know families have been literally torn apart for almost 70 years uh, over the f um, uh, battle of um, uh, this strip of land. And I thought, it's really time. If Coca-Cola is really going to show up as a leader in culture for India and Pakistan, it's time that we did our little piece to say, actually, Indians and Pakistanis are exactly the same. And when they can come together, they can have a beautiful moment of connection, just like any other race or just like any other combination of races. And so we did this ad called Small, Wo Small, Mo Small World Machines. Uh, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful demonstration that shows people who presume that there is a cultural difference, or at worst there is cultural hatred, um, are just like each other. And so I'd like to share that with you. The relationship between India and Pakistan is one that has seen a lot of laws. It's stressful, it's tense. It seems it's not improving and it's getting worse. It's only been 60 years that we have been apart. Before that, we were living harmoniously together. I think all the strife would go away if you took away the barbed in the middle of the two countries. It saddens me that we have this neighbor that we can't even go visit. They have this perception which they ingrain in the head that that's the bad guy. But when they actually meet them, they realize, you know what, he's just like me. Mainly because there's no communication. They're near us, but we have no access to them. And it's sad, because together I think we would do wonders. Creating an environment where young people can exchange ideas, thoughts, 
gestures and take away that communication gap that exists. If I have any opportunity to go to India, I'll surely go there. The whole idea of actually touching hands, it's like communicating with each other without words. And that action speaks louder than anything else. This is what we are supposed to do, right? We are going to take minor steps so that we are going to solve bigger issues. It is more about, you know, how similar we are as opposed to how different we are. Togetherness, humanity, this is what we want. More and more exchange. When that elderly lady says togetherness, humanity, this is what we want, more and more exchange, I mean, that was just a consumer quote. I didn't brief her, but as soon as I heard that, it had to go into uh, this ad because it's genuinely what I believe marketing can do. It can show that the world is better together. It can promote humanity uh, and it can be a facilitator um, uh, of great exchange. So that was one of the first pieces of cultural work that we did, which was bang on Coca-Cola's purpose. Um, uh, but what about the US? In 2013, the racial tensions in the US are horrific and upsetting. And as a mixed race black guy living in the States, I am very grateful that I am living in the States. But my goodness, it is hard to watch the news in the US. Um, and in 2013, um, it seemed that uh, racial tensions were getting um, uh, worse, not better. And so we decided that we were going to take the um, Super Bowl uh, spot um, uh, opportunity, uh, the world's biggest media event, and we were actually going to show the U.S. public that the face of America was changing, had always changed, and the shape of the American family um, uh, was changing. And so this was Coca-Cola's first ad that showed a gay family portrait. But what was really interesting is it just took the iconic song, America the Beautiful, and it shared that with the American people, but through the languages of different cultures. And it's really interesting because now I come to uh, um, Dublin and I hear so many different accents. I hear so many different languages. I'm at um, uh, FlyFit, the gym, for the last couple of mornings. I hear more Portuguese and Brazilian accents in that gym than I, I, I was expecting. And I love it. I geek out on the multiculturalism of this uh, city. And some of the ideology that this city has embraced is the kind of ideology that we were trying to put out with this work in um, uh, the Super Bowl of 2013. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. Por tus olas de granos So that ad aired. I'm managing the social media war room during the actual airing of it. My boss is um, in the actual stadium watching the game. My goodness, did the shit hit the fan. <laughs> it, the thing just blew up all over the place. And Coke found itself in the biggest shitstorm of consumer debate and public debate that it had ever uh, anticipated. Um, and, but, you know, and everybody was engaged. I actually got a tweet from Vice President Biden saying this is excellent work. This is shaping the America that we know and love. Uh, but then there was also so much hatred as well. Um, uh, and, but what I was really, really proud about uh, was that three years later, and I'm not at the company, I didn't drive this decision. I'd already left the company. But three years later, Coke re-aired this spot in this year's Super Bowl because it still believes that this kind of message is right. So, you know, yes, I was responsible for pushing it through, uh, kicking the 
proverbial can, um, but uh, Coke kind of picked it up and ran it again this year and enjoyed a much, much more positive sentiment this time round as the political climate in the US had changed. Uh, and so uh, people really did feel there was a need to share that kind of cultural message. So that's how an iconic brand does things. Three years ago, I left the iconic brand, came to an iconic company with the um, remit to help steer Airbnb so it can become the next Coca-Cola and it can become the next iconic brand. Uh, and as a brand geek, it was just like, it was such an irresistible proposition. Um, but I was really, really um, uh, curious. What was Airbnb's purpose? Did Airbnb have a cultural purpose that could get anywhere close to the cultural purpose of Coca-Cola? And in my first meeting with Brian Chesky, the chief exec uh, of the company and my boss, um, he talked about this world where because of the personal hospitality that our hosts can create, and because we're in 191 cities, we've got this beautiful pl platform and beautiful purpose that is a world where all seven and a half billion people can belong anywhere. When he told me about belong anywhere, I literally geeked out in my first meeting because belonging is such a primary driver of hum humanity and anywhere means it's global and so we've got to show up as a globally consistent and iconic brand. But how has that purpose impacted the marketing at um, Airbnb? Well, in 2015, um, the transgender community in the US was under attack. There were all sorts of laws being passed. The media narrative about the transgender community was vile. And um, I felt that if we were going to be truly, truly reflective of a world where anyone can belong anywhere, then it was right that we showed up and s demonstrated our support of the transgender community. And it just so happened that this was the year that Caitlyn Jenner um, made her public debut on the front cover of Vanity Fair magazine. Um, and she um, was recognized uh, for the Arthur Ashe Award uh, for bravery and courage. Unfortunately, it was a little bit like the Ellen moment, the Ellen DeGeneres moment of 20 years ago. Lots of advertisers decided to move out of that program because transgender was too hot an issue for advertisers to be seen to be supporting. I get a call from the media agency going, hey, Jonathan, 60 Second Spot has just appeared, um, just shown up just after Caitlin does her speech. Do you want it? And I was like, yes, I definitely want it. And then it was like, fuck, I have no idea what I'm going to run in it, but I know that we're going to make a good public statement about our support. Um, and to help you understand um, uh, just quite how poignant Caitlin's acceptance speech was. I'm going to play 60 seconds of the acceptance speech and then I'm going to play the commercial that sh um, appeared just after that. So this is just 60 seconds of Caitlin's speech. All across speech. this country right now, all across the world, at this very moment, there are young people coming to terms with being transgender. They're learning that they're different and they're trying to figure out how to handle that on top of every other problem that a teenager has. They're getting bullied. They're getting beaten up. They're getting murdered. And they're committing suicide. The numbers that you just heard before are staggering. But they are the reality of what it's like to be trans today. Just last month, the body of 17-year-old Mercedes Williamson, a transgender young woman of color, was found in a field in Mississippi, stabbed to death. I also want to tell you about Sam Taub, a 15-year-old transgendered young man from Bloomfield, Michigan. In early April, Sam took his own life. Now, Sam's story haunts me in particular because his death came just a few days before ABC aired my interview with Diane Sawyer. Every time something like this happens, people wonder, could it have been different if spotlighting this issue with more attention could have changed the way things happen, we'll never know. So that was the speech, and this was the commercial break, and it's entitled, Is Mankind? Is Mankind? Are we 
good. Go see. Go look through their windows so you can understand their views. Sit at their table so you can share their tastes. Sleep in their beds so you may know their dreams. Go see and find out just how kind the he's and she's of this mankind are. So I'm not trying to put another home on the platform. I'm not trying to book another night on the platform. I'm trying to help people understand what the Airbnb brand stands for, what the Airbnb community stands for. And if you ascribe to those ideals and those values, then you'll join us. And if you don't, then we don't want you. And it's really as simple as that. Um, but how did the world respond? Um, it blew up in another significant way. Um, but it was much more um, um, positive than the Coke experience that we initially had. And I just love uh, this uh, headline from The Advocate. Airbnb support for Caitlyn Jenner transkind will give you goosebumps. Uh, and that's the kind of impact on some of this cultural work. That's the kind of uh, effect that we're looking for. Um, a little bonus, to be honest, was um, this that we received uh, a couple of days after the ad aired. Uh, and I'll read it to you. Dear Brian and Jonathan, I want to commend you on the beautiful spot is mankind. As I'm learning every day, the transgender community is so grateful for people to share their stories. Please thank all the good folk at Airbnb that helped bring this story to life. Thank you for your leadership. Sincerely, Caitlin Jenner. We didn't have a relationship with Caitlin at all. She found out about the spot after she'd um, uh, made her acceptance speech and she took it upon herself to express her gratitude for that. I carry this card with me in my bag all the time. It never, I never leave um, uh, this card at home because again, like the boys on a bench, it just reminds me of the impact that we can have when we do purpose-driven marketing. Now, that's all very good because what we're talking about is looking out into the world, figuring out what's going on in terms of culture and figuring out if your brand purpose can lean into it in a very, very effective way. What happens though when shit happens on your doorstep? And this time last year, there was a lot of shit on the Airbnb doorstep and it was the narrative around discrimination on our platform. Now, you can only imagine the founders created this company through their own experience of opening up their own apartments and welcoming strangers into their apartments uh, on a temporary basis. And the net effect is creating friendships all over the world. And that evolved to this purpose. One day, all seven and a half billion people can feel like they can belong anywhere on the Airbnb platform because of our products and services. And yet, because of the hyper growth and stuff, we found out, we, it was like we were running along and we ran into this glass wall because there was discrimination on the platform. There was bigotry on the platform. People were being discriminated against because of sexual orientation or because of their race. And just to give you a flavor of how serious this issue was, I just want to play this newsreel, um, uh, which is basically a montage of some news clippings of just 12 months ago. Accusations now surfacing about Airbnb, the popular home sharing site where many hosts are being called out by users for rejecting them based on the color of their skin. Latina Crittenden says she experienced racial bias on Airbnb. She started the hashtag Airbnb while black. Being denied because of the way I look, I mean, it sucks. Two at 11, a controversy involving the popular travel site Airbnb is going viral. So white guests 50% of the time got a yes, while African-American guests only got a yes 42% of the time. And you're An Airbnb host in North Carolina is accused of sending vile messages to a business student. Messages apparently from the Airbnb host that were so offensive, the company decided to ban him for life. So this hurt. This hurt the company. It was like a body blow to the company. Um, but again, I was so, so impressed and grateful to work at a purpose-driven company because we stopped 
the company stopped and the um, task force went through all disciplines of the company, all levels of the company. We all came together to really, we worked with external experts to help us navigate this and navigate it quickly. And um, uh, we developed more sophisticated technology. Uh, we developed the com uh, community uh, compact. Now, if you want to rent your home on the Airbnb platform or you want to book a trip on the Airbnb platform, you have to sign a declaration that says that you as an individual have zero tolerance for discrimination, racism, or any form of bigotry on the platform. And if we sense that there is a host that is operating in this way, they're immediately ghosted. There's you know, one strike and, and you're out. Brian Chesky, my boss, famously said that, you know, he's more than happy to slow down the growth of the Airbnb platform so that we can put our human ideology and our purpose first and foremost. So last year was a year of insanely intense work to get our platform to the place that was serving the um, brand purpose in a really, really robust way. Uh, and we moved in just 12 months from that narrative that was going on in the news to being able to run our first Super Bowl spot, which talks about universal belonging. And this was a big bet for us because we've still got work to do. We're not out of the woods on this yet at all. We're talking about human ba behavior and human values. And it takes time to really, really make sure that everything is working in the way that you intend. But we put this ad out on uh, Super Bowl and I'll share with you the results of this ad in a moment. So we ran that, it was our first Super Bowl debut, and it was like the Coke thing. The media responded, and they responded in a really, really, really positive way. Um, of course, the cultural narrative at the time was really um, uh, uh, working for us as well, given the political changes and the political narrative in the, U in the US. Um, uh, but it was really about us and our platform and who you are and how you will be accepted. So how did it perform? Uh, so this chart just shows you, during the duration of the Super Bowl, um, how big the conversation was for each of the brands they're advertising. This is the Coca-Cola spot of three years ago, so Coke had a great performance. Um, Airbnb coming in, um, in at number two. Um, uh, dwarfed only by T-Mobile, but I will say that we only had a 30-second spot. They had 90 seconds of activity, and they had Justin Bieber dancing around. So um, uh, the Bieber conversation was arguably bigger than the T-Mobile conversation. But it was a fantastic debut for us and the net positive sentiment was 96% positive sentiment of Americans saying, we love the values that Airbnb are putting into practice. So how did it go as far as the earned impressions and uh, the level of PR that we got um, uh, uh, going on this? Uh, it was a huge moment for us, and so we were the third most talked about um, uh, brand as far as end impressions are concerned for this year's Super Bowl. And for us, it was our second biggest moment in our own narrative after the launch of um, trips in um, uh, LA last November. And um, uh, the We Accept hashtag was the most shared and most engaged hashtag of the Super Bowl. So a really, really... Um, uh, big impact that we've been able to make and we're a young company we're only nine years old um, uh, but we are a purpose-driven company and I'm very very pleased that I work for a company that allows us to put purpose into our marketing um, uh, during times where it's most salient to do so so what have I shared with you and what I, have I hope you remember and you take away with you purpose-driven companies outperform non-purpose-driven companies Purpose drives performance. Purpose should also ensure the right kind of growth. Sometimes companies like Airbnb have to take a risk that we're going to slow down our own growth so that we can make sure our purpose is honored before we accelerate growth again. And I think that's really, really important. And you see a lot of companies who are in hyper growth who 
suddenly start to just pull back a little bit so they can get their act together and then they can kind of re-accelerate. Uh, and Airbnb is one of those companies. So purpose drives the right kind of growth because if you're purpose-driven, there's some growth that you don't want. Um, but I do think that purpose is personal. And if I could get you to think of anything when you leave me today, um, uh, I'd just like you to think of your own purpose. And what really does drive you? What are the two, three or four values that you feel that you should put front and center of your thinking, your actions, the way you impact your team, the way you lead your own businesses. Purpose is personal, and you should be able to tie your own personal purpose to the purpose of the company. And then finally, purpose-driven marketing is legacy-driven marketing. I only hope that in 30 years' time, there's somebody looking at the digital archive at Coca-Cola and pulling out either the India and Pakistan small world machine ad that we did, or the um, America the Beautiful, and going, I want to do work that is that purposeful. So much of marketing is what I call disposable. People don't want it in the first place. They then see it and they feel it's an interruption and they'll never look at it again. And as marketers, you have a responsibility to create value when uh, people engage with your marketing. Um, and you can do that by doing purpose-driven marketing.